It's a proper Hollywood chair, isn't it? In New York. Guys, let's, let's uh, give it up for Above and Beyond. My name is Matt Medved. I'm the head of Billboard's Dance and Electronic Music Department. I had the pleasure of catching these guys on the acoustic tour at the New York show. Um, how many people here got to see the, uh, the concert? <laughs> amazing, amazing. So uh, I thought the film was excellent, and I was just telling them outside, I also thought it was really important because electronic music is one of the few genres of music where the way in which songs are composed isn't always apparent by the way they're performed. And the acoustic project gave fans, I think, a really rare and valuable glimpse into their songwriting process and into their musicianship that otherwise wouldn't have been apparent unless you'd been in the studio with them. And so I, on that you know, note, I wanted to ask just, you know, if they could talk a little bit more about um, you know, the approach uh, that you took when uh, taking these songs and adapting them to a whole different arrangement because uh, it, I mean, I, speaking for myself, but I feel like great songs shine through regardless of arrangement or style and I think that this tour and this project made that really apparent. I think one of the things that really helps us because we are uh, three people and we know the songs so well was actually kind of farming out the origination of the, the acoustic versions of them to somebody else and uh, having Bob Bradley from, I mean he knows our stuff quite well but he's got his own kind of style of arrangement, he's a big fan of Angela Badalamenti and John Barry and that kind of 60s uh, sweeping swing, uh, strings kind of production um, and I think that sort of helped gel it all together because obviously when you take away the the sound of the production that people know there is a, there's a danger that the thing could end up being quite disparate and we, we certainly didn't want to do a thing like a, like a fireside acoustic strumming, you know, that I think would have been uh, selling it short, really. So I think having somebody else uh, with us, obviously, but um, largely independently deciding how the song should be arranged was, was very helpful. Yeah, I mean, there were certain tracks we had a clear idea of how they should be and um, certain ones that Bob had a very clear idea as well. You know, there were some that came back and we felt they were too different from the originals as well. Um, so we ended up going back to the drawing board with those and going back in the studio and working on those with him as well. So it's sort of various different methods of getting to the end, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite moments came when, uh, right before you guys came on, went out on stage at the Hollywood Bowl and you could kind of see in your expressions and your body language the enormity of the moment, you know, that you guys have been preparing for a very long time for. Um, from an artist's perspective, how do you uh, kind of, how did you sort of handle the pressure of putting on such a big show at these iconic venues? I don't know if we did handle the pressure. I can speak from my own experience. It was, that was, yeah, one of the most stressful tours I think I've ever been involved in. Um, I'd like to be less stressed le next time because it, it's, so much more exhausting than doing a DJ tour. There's so many more commitments. Um, there's, you know, more sound checks, more rehearsals, uh, kind of more, I would say not more traveling, but just less time to actually relax. So um, it, it's an exhausting thing to do. I don't know if we did handle it. The thing for me that was, that's really great about playing in a 15 piece band is it doesn't really matter if you just stop. Nobody's gonna notice, you know. <laughs> Um, because, <laughs> you know, you've got all these amazing musicians. I mean, some of the guys that we had on stage with us are just extraordinary. Tim, the guy who's playing trumpet and trombone and guitar and keyboards and backing vocals and everything else is just this annoyingly talented guy. Uh, and he's been, you know, playing live like that all his life. And the bass players are, you know, real pro. The drummers were incredible. Um, Bob's just effortlessly uh, great at what he does. So I, I had that feeling that it didn't really matter if I didn't play that note or that chord, it, you know, it, the thing would keep going. Yeah. And that's one of the lovely things about making music with other people is that it's that kind of team effort and your own part is, is important, but it's not critical like it is when you're DJing. If you push the wrong button, the music will stop, you know. <laughs> um, 
so for me, in some ways, ironically, I, I, I hear what John is saying, but for me, it was, it's kind of more relaxing to be in a, in a big ensemble like that because <laughs> it just keeps going if you stop. You know? I think also we made the decision early on to surround ourselves with musicians who are kind of better than us. So, um, <laughs> Which is not <laughs> <it's> hard. Helpful. <laughs> now, you guys are, have just released a new studio album, Common Ground, and you are... And, and you're also currently touring North America on the Common Ground Tour. Uh, tell us a little bit about the process of going from a project like Acoustic to pr you know, producing and making a full-fledged, you know, above and beyond studio album and reprising some of those collaborations with uh, you know, familiar faces like Richard and, and Zoe and, and such. Over to you. No. Um, <laughs> Well, we really wanted to do some more stuff with Richard Bedford. I mean, we'd written um, many of the songs, all of them actually, I think, really. Um, and we were looking, it, we, it was quite up to the wire actually, wasn't it, in terms of finding a male vocalist for this album. And in the back of our heads, we knew Richard was bubbling away there. And uh, we, we wanted to get him involved, really. And we were quite concerned, how's it going to turn out? You know, we didn't know how his voice was going to sound. And uh, we tried him out on the record, uh, on Northern Soul, actually, first. I think it was, wasn't it? And he just sounded amazing. And we were like, <laughs> let's do this, you know. So it was great to get back to work with him. He's got such a fragile voice. It's so emotional. Um, and it, it really suits our sound, I think. So really happy to get back with him. Zoe, do you want to talk about Zoe or I mean, I'm, I'm still, I think I, I said it on some of the gigs in the acoustic tour, I still sort of pinch myself that she's still in the band after the, all these years. She's been with us since 2004. I've always considered her one of the most extraordinary singer songwriters that I've ever encountered. I think um, she's done with always what I've always said is her biggest strength, which is to write a song with two conflicting points of view in it. and kind of get you to buy into both always is a song about somebody who could come and save your life or not and I think it's it's always been uh, a charm in her songwriting that she's able to do that for me it's it makes the songs more interesting uh, it was something she exhibited on uh, crazy English summer which is the first song I'd ever heard her sing and write uh, it's a song about going home to see your boyfriend and whether it's great that, or your ex-boyfriend and whether it's a a great thing that he's out of your life or whether it's a great thing that you're going to get back together and i and i i love that it's it's very easy to be didactic in songs and be um you know happy or sad but she manages to walk that line between them and uh you know it's uh, i think her songs on the album are fantastic and um you know i remember when i first watched the common ground music video um there's a real uh, defined narrative there of inclusion and unity. And I found that really welcome, given the sort of volatile political climate we're in. Um, you being from the UK, having the specter of Brexit, us having uh, President Trump here. Why was it important for you to um, make sure that that body of work um, expressed that sentiment? I think it's, it's a shame that we needed to talk about it ironically i don't know if you've known while we, we were at dinner tonight we saw that actually in the state of the union address mr trump said that uh, it's important that we seek out common ground so john 999 in all good record stores yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, you know it's 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 even reached him i i i, th I think that the, the the internet has 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 worked on on public opinion like a like a like a spin dryer. Everybody's out on the edge. There's very few people in the middle ground anymore. And I think um, it, it feels like people want to take a position on something. They want to point at somebody else that's not like them and call them an enemy. And I think politics always used to be about negotiation, and now it's a kind of a war. And whether it's Brexit, you know, we want to be out of Europe. I mean, we don't, but. A majority of the people who went and voted in that referendum wanted to, to leave Europe and turn their back on that that union. I think our experience of the world is completely different from that. Uh, we go to all different countries in the world. We go to you know on consecutive days countries that are at war with each other. 
And what we find actually is this people are the same, really, basically. And, uh, and I think for us to have been able to point that out with the album sleeve and, 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 and the album title and, and really reflect the experience that we have, which is wherever we go, there are people coming together from all walks of life and from all different backgrounds, and they seem to find this sense of unity in our shows. It's something that people who... Uh, we, we were with a journalist yesterday, and she it was the first Above Me on show, and one of the things that she found most incredible was you guys. Uh, I think we are very lucky that our fans have this sense of community that they instill in people who come to the gigs for the first time and they instill it in everybody that goes around. That's really the common ground and, and I guess the, the group therapy ethos. And we feel very privileged to be uh, lucky enough to have attracted an audience that feels that way because that, that's really how we, we experience the world. And it's nice that they're spreading the message. Makes sense. We've got a few questions from some T-Mobile uh, Twitter followers. The first one comes from Neil Mettler, who asks, which song on the album took the longest to produce, and how many versions did it take? It's easy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Bittersweet and Blue probably had the most versions. I think we made the 100 on that, didn't we? Oh, yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah, we, always, we were always counting uh, down on the, well, counting up on the uh, version numbers, although it's a bit distorted because sometimes you just save a new version. Certain members of the group save, you know, a version more often that has a different number anyway, so... Um, but I think, I think uh, Bits of Wheat and Blue had the most, the most revisions. Can you think it of it? did, and, and it, it was a, a song that, when we went to master the album, had no guitars on it whatsoever. And then uh, in the context of listening to the... I don't know how the guitar crept into all the tracks, but it did on this album, and I'm very pleased with that. Um, but it, Jono said, maybe it needs some guitar in the chorus. So even after the album was mastered, I think on the Saturday night after watching Match of the Day, I recorded some guitars at home that ended up... Fueled by a nice curry. Yes, yeah. indeed, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, but, I mean, I think some of the songs have been more than two years in in writing and production. We, we don't really stop. It's not like we, we have like two years of touring and then we stop and do an album. Some of those tracks have been happening, you know, new stuff is happening all the time. And uh, Sahara Love is about two years, I think. Uh, Northern Soul is probably about two years as well. Uh, the next one comes from US UK Lad. Uh, do they feel a burden of responsibility to keep doing uh, more when they hear how important their music is to people? Or does that just inspire you? Um, rather than the burden of responsibility, I think it, it sort of gives a bit more purpose. I, I mean, I always feel like you don't get into music purely for altruistic reasons, to be honest. You, you do it because you love doing it and you enjoy making music, it's, you know, like any art, I think. But... That said, once you then have a career in it and you, your music goes out there and the highs and lows of life come your way, suddenly the fact that you've got an audience who are engaged in your work and are interested keeps you going through the, the lows as well, I think. As well, you know, that's a particular thing. So suddenly, you know, the music that you made in your bedroom on a little computer in a little studio suddenly has meaning to people and you've got a purpose and, and that really pushes you forward in the, in the tough times as well. I think that burden's not necessarily a bad thing. I think uh, having some kind of external pressure guiding you, whatever it is that you do, the feeling that somebody else is relying on you is actually a very healthy thing for human beings, I think. Um, so, you know, all the tweets that say don't ever stop what you're doing, it does spur you on to keep doing it. Last one from our T-Mobile Twitter followers. We've got Nancy Marquez. Is there any city or country that you haven't performed in that you would like to visit and share your music? Well, we've been to South Africa, but we haven't really been to the rest of Africa. We've been to, we've been to North Africa as well. We've been to Tunisia, haven't we? A bit in the middle, not so much. It's quite a large bit in between, isn't it? Yeah, there is. <laughs> so there's your answer. <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa, I guess, that's the, that's the largest area of the world that we've not been to. We've been pretty much everywhere else, which is lovely. 
All right, I think that wraps it up for this. If you're tuning into the live stream, you can catch the documentary at cinemas across North America and with worldwide dates to be announced. Everybody give it up one more time for Above and Beyond. Thank you. Thank you.